The title of this message tonight is Your Life in the Image of God. And I take you to Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. And God said, let us make man in our image. God said, let us. Who was God speaking to? Well, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They decided together to make man in our image, after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. In great love, God made man in his image. Not only physically, spiritually. Man and woman were created to display the beautiness of God's holiness and to reveal and display the characteristics of God's righteousness. The Bible says that God spoke the sun and the moon into existence. He spoke the earth and all of its creatures into existence. But when it came to Adam, God got down into the dust and carefully molded and made Adam in his image out of the dust of the earth. God then breathed life into his creation and Adam became a living soul pure and holy as God himself. The first man, Adam, along with his wife Eve, they were given the great responsibility to be over the human race. And with this responsibility, God also gave them the power of free choice, a grave, heavy responsibility. What a power this is. The choice was theirs to serve God, and obey him in love, or turn from God's love and authority to do as they please. The power of free choice was Adam and Eve's opportunity to prove and demonstrate their love and devotion to God. So in the Garden of Eden, God places a fruit-bearing tree there, the, no the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then the Lord instructs them both not to eat of this tree. Now they have choice. What will they do? Unfortunately, we read that Adam and Eve disobeyed God's word. Yet when they sinned against God, they never considered the consequences of their choice. Because by their sin, the earth and this civilization was cursed. They were no longer a part of the family of God. Sin now contaminated them and death by sin. They had lost the spiritual image of God in their lives. As a result of Adam's sin, everyone born after Adam would be born in sin with the sentence of death upon them. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Adam and Eve's choice to disobey God has affected the entire human race. Now everyone born into this world, the image of God in them is flawed deformed, broken, however you want to label it. Born in sin, the image of God is no longer resembling. The image of man, rather, no longer resembles the image of God. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 51.5, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. God will look down from his throne of grace only to behold his image, now corrupted by sin and disobedience. The sinful Adamic nature now ruled in the lives of human beings. The power of sin dominated this civilization. 
people hopeless and helpless to live for God, to live like God. If you read in the early part of the Old Testament, it reveals how God diligently strove to work the heads of families in an attempt to make them a godly example for their families. Yet so few would yield to God. But those who did, God would bless them and make them a mighty witness. Individuals such as Noah, Enoch, Abraham, and Job. These individuals yielded their human vessel to God, and he was able to make them into his image of holiness and righteousness. Later in the Old Testament, God gave his law to Moses. By the law, people received the knowledge of sin. Up to this point, most in the human race had no idea of what sin actually was. But by the law, people also came into the understanding that the image of God in them was corrupt. It was broken. It could not function properly. The law exposed man's shortcomings, their defiled nature, and the fact that they needed help. They needed a Savior. The law God gave to Moses could only go so far for people. It could reveal to them their sinful nature. However, the law was powerless to deliver them from it. In the law, God allowed one day a year, the Day of Atonement, in which people could receive forgiveness. So animal sacrifice would be made, blood spilled for the atonement of sin. And by these sacrifices, people were forgiven of their sins. But as I said, these sacrifices were powerless to change their spiritual image and keep them out of sin. People would receive forgiveness on the Day of Atonement and then shortly thereafter go right back into the same sins. Over and over and over. As a result, God hated these sacrifices. At this time, I want to take you to the seventh chapter of Romans. Here, the Apostle Paul writes about the trouble that he had to deal with under the law with the corrupt sinful nature that he lived with. Before his salvation through Jesus Christ, Paul was a strict Pharisee under the law, yet he struggled to abide by the law. And this left him in a miserable condition. Listen to Paul describe his life his predicament that he was in as a Pharisee, a religious ruler who was to uphold the law, yet he himself could not live by it. In Romans chapter 7, beginning in verse 14, Paul writes, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. No, the law forbids it. For that, for what I would, that do I not. He could not attain the full measure of the law. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that, which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Paul knew the law was righteous and good. He just couldn't live by it. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. He could not live up to the law, and it revealed the sinful nature he possessed. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. You know, Jesus says the same thing in John chapter 15. Without me, ye can do nothing. Without me, you are nothing. For in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. Oh, he had the desire to do right. 
but how to perform that which is good, I find not. No, his image was corrupt, defiled. He did not have it within him to do right, even though he wanted to do right. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. This is a picture of the human race. Examining himself in the mirror of the law of God, Paul realizes that his spiritual image does not match God's image. His spiritual image is flawed, carnal, sinful as he called it, unable to operate as God intended. In this chapter, Paul confesses before his conversion, he was, he was unable to perform that which is good. Yet that which is wrong is what he did. And this predicament that not only Paul but the whole human race found themselves in, this is why God sent Jesus into the world. John 3, 16 and 17 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Since Jesus came, people no longer need to depend on animal sacrifice, for God provide his own sacrifice of divine blood for the human race. John 1, 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God would be the sacrifice made at Calvary, a sacrifice made once and for all people, that whosoever believeth upon him and his sacrifice would be saved. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5 through 7 and 10. Here in this reading of Scripture, it speaks of God the Father and Jesus. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not. God now no longer accepted sacrifices. Sending Jesus into the world. Instead, he prepared a body for Jesus that would be sacrificed at Calvary. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Jesus came into this world to do the will of God. That will being fulfill the plan of redemption. Die on the cross, spill divine blood as the great sacrifice for the human race, and then be resurrected the third day. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. In the divine blood of Jesus there is power to cleanse a person of all sin, to deliver them from that sinful, corrupt spiritual image, that Adamic nature, making them spiritually brand new. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So if you're one claiming, believing to be a Christian, but yet there's old still left inside of you. Old ways of talking, old ways of doing, old ways of thinking, old ways of operating. You're not brand new. You have not been born again. You're not saved. Jesus said, except a man be born again, they cannot see the kingdom of God. Born again, a spiritual rebirth through the power that's in the blood of Jesus. Only the power of the blood can restore the broken image of God in every person who will yield and believe upon Jesus 
and that sacrifice at Calvary. And that new image will function properly. It will function in the holiness and the righteousness of God. Jesus, when he speaks of a born-again experience, he's not speaking of a self-help program or a positive thinking approach that is so popular in society today. Neither is the remedy joining a church or being baptized in water or doing the best you can. Doing the best you can is never enough in the eyes of God. To be born again is a spiritual rebirth that can only take place through the power in the divine blood of Jesus. And those that receive the born-again experience are become partakers of God's divine nature. The divine nature that Adam and Eve lost in the garden when they sinned against God. Paul wrote again in Colossians chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, after the image of God. The new man. Are you that new man and woman? Or is there any old yet contaminating you? Being born again means the old sinful person and its deeds and its actions, which do not resemble God, are gone. Not hidden, not covered up, gone. No longer a part of you. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24. Paul wrote, And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. True holiness. True holiness is God's holiness. True holiness is Bible holiness. Not man's version of holiness. The only holiness, the only standard for holiness is the Word of God. The Apostle Paul, he understood what he wrote about. For he experienced this himself. In Acts chapter 9, we read of Paul receiving the born-again experience. Paul, being a Pharisee of the law, hated Jesus and sought to do away with his church. And the Pharisees, the religious rulers, they despised Jesus because Jesus came as a light into the world. His truth, his life, his power exposed the religious rulers for the hypocrites that they were. They would hide behind the law and practice sin, yet claim to be justified by the law. And there is no justifying of sin. And Jesus revealed that. So they hated Jesus and his church. He was on the road to the city of Damascus to arrest Christians, to bring them back to Jerusalem and put them on trial. And as he traveled towards the city, he was knocked into the dust. And there, Jesus revealed himself to Paul. Thank God Paul yielded. And he took on the new man. He became born again, receiving that powerful experience. And then while in Damascus, Paul was baptized in the Holy Ghost. And he began to preach Christ in the synagogues there. Think of it. A new man now. He went to that city one man, bent and determined to arrest as many Christians as he could and put them on trial in Jerusalem. But now in the city, he's preaching Christ. Preaching Christ Jesus. Acts chapter 9, verses 21 and 22. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem? And came hither for that intent, that he might bring them bound under the chief priests. But Saul increased the more in strength, and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, 
proving that this is very Christ. Saul would later become Paul. Now he is in the spiritual image of God. A new man, as he wrote, created in righteousness and true holiness. Now I want to take you back to the seventh chapter of Romans. Here Paul, not only did he write of the description of his former life as a Pharisee, a miserable hypocrite, a failure, knowing to do right, but yet he could not. Now, with this great internal conflict within him, of this spiritual, sinful image, unable to please God, at the end of this chapter, Paul reveals the remedy that he personally experienced himself. It is the remedy that everyone who desires to believe, please God and cannot within themselves, this is the remedy you need. And in Romans chapter 7, verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Romans 8, 1 and 2. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. The law of the Spirit of the life of Christ Jesus, that born-again experience made Paul free from the bondage of the law of sin and death. Jesus came to earth, not only to die for our sins, to be that sacrifice on behalf of the human race, he came also as the Son of Man to show us how to live, to demonstrate in perfection the spiritual image of God in human clay. And Jesus said in John 14, 9, Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you? And yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Tonight I ask you, when a person looks upon you, what image do they see? When they look upon you, do they see your mother or father? Do they see traits in the image of a loved one passed away? Or do they see the image of Jesus in your life? Does your life reflect the teachings of Jesus? Are you a living epistle, as Paul wrote to one of the churches? In other words, are you a living example of God's Word, a living demonstration for others to see? People in doctrines that state no one can live free from sin, they are denying the Word of God, and they are denying the great power in the divine blood of Jesus. Yet Paul warned that in the last days, this would happen. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. All must be careful of carrying a form and lacking the power. The power through the blood, the power through the word, the power through the Holy Ghost, the power that divinity has made available to man through Jesus Christ to live a life holy, righteous, and pure. Turn away from such doctrines of men and turn to the word of God, the truth. Because Jesus said, know the truth and you'll be free. And in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4, God warns, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the pure in heart, a heart free of sin. 
corruption and contamination. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Does this sound like an image of God with contaminations and flaws? Does this sound like a spiritual vessel that is broken, deformed, and unable to function in the holiness and righteousness of God? The Son of God was sent to earth, I say again, as the Son of Man. He was sent to be God's love gift to the human race. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Life is short when you compare it to eternity. And what a person does with their power of free choice will determine where they spend their eternity. Friend, tonight God offers you his gift. The gift of salvation, the gift of eternal life that comes only through Jesus Christ. You have the opportunity right now to receive God's gift. This is a gift. God will not impose these gifts upon anyone. With your power of free choice, you must decide. Will you believe, open your heart's door, and receive these gifts? Or will you doubt and turn away? Friend, heed the word of God. Come to Jesus tonight. Because the word says, if we confess our sin, God is faithful. He is just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. This is your opportunity right now to believe upon the word of God, open your heart's door, and receive God's gifts unto your life. Pray this prayer with me right now. And I want everyone here to pray with me. Most of you don't need to say this prayer, but there may be one or a few in our midst who do. And you out there tonight, pray this prayer. Pray this prayer and mean it from your heart. Say, Oh God, I confess all of my sin before you. Forgive me, Father, and I will serve you the rest of my life. And I believe that Jesus died on the cross spilled divine blood, and was resurrected the third day. And I believe the power in that blood washes away all of my sin. Say, come into my heart, Jesus. Come into my heart, dear Jesus. And friend, if you meant that prayer, Jesus is yours. And with the gifts of salvation, eternal life, that come through the blood. Healing for the body also comes through the blood. Peter wrote that Jesus bore our sins on the tree and then would buy his stripes. The stripes placed on his back at the whipping post, we have healing. Healing for our bodies. And before Jesus ascended back into heaven in Mark 16, he told his followers, his believers, they would lay hands on the sick and they would recover. Friend, I'm the Lord's believer. Reverend Steve is the Lord's believer. There are many believers in our midst. And I want you, if you're in need, to put your hand on the screen as a form of laying on of hands, as Jesus spoke of, to agree with me now, as the Lord's believer, that the Lord will make you well, that you will recover by the power in the blood of Jesus. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I bring those who are sick in body before you. Lord, those who have a great need in their life. Lord, there's great power in the blood of Jesus. And by that power, Lord, they can be made well. Lay a healing hand upon each one. And Lord, let that virtue flow to their bodies now. In the name of Jesus, Lord, heal. In the holy blood name of Jesus, lay a healing hand on each one. And Lord, make them well, make them whole for your honor and for your glory. In the holy name of Jesus, and amen. Now, friend, watch every improvement. Give God the praise, the honor, and the glory for what he does for you. Jesus paid the price to make you whole. And friend, you can have the gift of the Holy Ghost. The gift of Jesus 
through Jesus Christ, the gifts never end. The gifts keep coming to you. God has so much for his children, so many precious gifts, salvation, eternal life, healing, deliverance, and the gift of the Holy Ghost. It's according to Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39. You can have this gift, and it's a promise, a promise unto you. Retake this promise, claim it, and be baptized in the Holy Ghost. And everyone here, I want you to stand to your feet tonight in this auditorium. And you out there who are watching this live stream, stand to your feet. Lift up your hands right now. And if you're without the Holy Ghost baptism, you can receive the Holy Ghost. You can be filled with the Holy Ghost right now. Friend, what an opportunity this is for you to receive this gift of God. Just lift up your hands right now and start praising the Lord. Rejoice in Jesus Christ. Give praises unto Him. And as I call this anointing down upon you, you can have the Holy Ghost. The presence of the Holy Ghost will move in. He will move in right where you are, and He will baptize you. He will come in. Just lift up praises unto Jesus. Glorify in Jesus from your heart from your mind, with your lips and your tongue, glorifying Jesus, praising Him. Oh, He is worthy, friend, and the Holy Ghost, He'll come in. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I bring the people before you tonight, those without the Holy Ghost. God, anoint them to open their heart's door. Anoint them to believe, to receive. In the name of Jesus, I call this anointing down. In the name of Jesus, receive ye the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus, receive ye the Holy Ghost. And friend, just keep praising the Lord. Keep praising till the Holy Ghost comes in. Let the Holy Ghost move in. Let the Holy Ghost have his way in the blood name of Jesus. Keep praising the Lord. Don't stop till the Holy Ghost comes in. Don't stop till the Holy Ghost comes in. And when he comes in, friend, he'll take over your tongue. When he comes in, he'll speak using your tongue in another language, a glorious language. He will give the utterance. It is his miracle signifying he has come in. In the blood name of Jesus, Lord, we praise you, dear Jesus. We glorify you, dear Jesus. We praise your holy name. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Ghost and praising the Lord, praising Jesus, glorifying Jesus. He's worthy to be praised, worthy to be honored. Glory, glory, glory to Jesus. Oh, keep praising the Lord. Keep praising Jesus. Don't stop till the Holy Ghost comes in, friend. Don't stop. Tarry in His presence. Tarry in the presence of the Lord till the Holy Ghost baptizes you. Keep praising. Keep yielding. Keep praising. In the name of Jesus. In the holy name of Jesus. In the precious name of Jesus.